today's episode of News at Today, we have a special segment of conflict. We will be traveling through time to get a closer look of what really went wrong. First up, we're traveling to Russia to talk to a librarian who knows exactly about what went wrong with the law. Hello, I am currently in the library of the State Historical Museum of Russia. This museum holds many documents describing the history of Russia. There is one document that will be most helpful in identifying conflict between the Mongols and the Russian state of Novgorod. The document is the Chronicle of Novgorod, written from 1016 AD to 1471 AD by the monks from the Yuri Monastery of Novgorod. What specific quote is there that describes the conflict between the Mongols and the people of Novgorod? One quote is, Novgorod is the only Russian state or city of importance which escapes full subjugation by the Mongols, and even Novgorod becomes the vassal of the Mongols. This quote shows that the Mongols held Russian states against their will, and Novgorod only escaped this by pledging loyalty to the Mongols. The attack on the Russian state by the Mongols is described in the Chronicle. In 1327 AD, a mighty Mongol host took Tver, a city near present-day Moscow in Russia, and wasted all the Russian land. Novgorod alone was spared, on payment of a big sum. This quote shows why Novgorod was spared, because it paid a tribute and money and pledged loyalty to the Mongols. Thank you for your story about conflict. So now we are traveling. Traveling. Oh my god, Lauren, you're so bad! That is so <laughs> Now, we are traveling all the way to the Windbird Castle Church to talk to Martin Luther. I'm very excited to be here. Yes, of course. <laughs> what is that? I think we would all like it. Did I, I think we good one? Well, I just want to start by saying how generally loyal I am to the Catholic Church, and I stand by them. Now that I've said that, something seemed off about the Church from the beginning. We had to pay them simply to live, and if we didn't, it's a sin? Did God say this? How does the Pope know this is what God wanted if it was not stated in the Bible? So, I decided to look into what overlapped with the Church and the Bible's words. I concluded that something was going on as I hypothesized. The thing that really tipped me over the edge was the fact that the average person could now pay to get into heaven. This really baffled me, so I decided to take note. What were your intentions with the 95 Theses? I really just wanted to exploit the church and how it was really breaking its own rules when it came to morality. Of course. So how did you assume followers the church would react? Since I was trying to get the church's attention, I thought the followers wouldn't get involved. Clearly, things did not go as planned. You created a pretty big conflict between the regulars and the church. Why do you think that is? I assume people just heard my words and really spoke to them. I brought an example if you'd like. It's from my 95 Theses. Number 43. Christians are to be taught that the Pope does not intend that the buying of indulgences should in any way be compared with works of mercy. Wow, that really shows how much you and the church disagree. Um, I guess it really shows how you two were in conflict. Okay, Christopher, I have a few simple questions to ask you. So can we get to know each other a little bit? For starters, can you explain your first voyage to us? Sure. So it all began on August 3rd, 1492, when I set sail from Spain to find an all-water route to Asia. On October 12th, more than two months later, I landed on an island in the Bahamas that I like to call San Salvador, but the natives call it Guahani. For nearly, three, for nearly five months later, I explored the Caribbean before returning to Spain. I kidnapped several Native Americans between 10 and 25. 
to take them back to Spain. Only eight survived. I also brought back small amounts of gold as well as native birds and plants to show the riches of the continent that I believe to be Asia. Very fascinating. Did you come across any problems that were hard to face? Yeah, I did come across many problems. The conflicts that I faced, which was with the indigenous people, the Indians, include all of the violence, slavery, and the forced, well, I don't call it forced, maybe voluntary, conversations of native peoples to Christianity. I didn't understand what the people's problem was. All I wanted to do was convert as many of them I could to spread Christianity. Wow, I never knew you had so much conflict with the natives. Yep. Also, Christopher, could you explain in a few sentences? Because we're running out of time for this segment. Um, what your letter to Ferdinand and Isabella was about? Oh yes, my letter. Okay, so when I arrived back in Spain, March 15th, 1493, I immediately wrote this letter announcing my discovery to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel, who had helped me finance their trip. Thank you so much. I was so grateful that they said yes to helping me. Also, in the beginning, I described a little of my first voyage, including those natives. In the letter, I said, I discovered many islands inhabited by numerous people. I took possession of them and for our most fortunate king by making public proclamation and unfurfluing unfurf his statement, no one making. There is always conflict no matter where you go because different groups of people believe in different things and you will often disagree, disagree to compete with each other. Oh, and that's it for the segment. I just want to say, Christopher, you look very familiar. In 2001, there was a terrorist attack on September 11th in New York. We managed to find a survivor of the attack and interview him right here. What was it like arriving at the World Trade Center? But all this debris came down, it was kind of like it looked like meteors, and, the meteor, and, and things were hitting the rig, and I saw a large chunks of flaming uh, debris coming down, and uh, for a little while I thought we were not going to get off the block. So you started going up stairway B of the North Tower, and obviously it was very crowded for people coming down, but what else was it like? The building started shaking, and uh, I remember I was holding on to this concrete, and I, I didn't know what was going on, but the building's shaking, really noticeably shaking. Uh, and I thought maybe it was the elevator shafts coming down, you know, the elevators coming down the shafts, maybe they cut loose. I didn't know what was going on, but I was holding on. I was a little concerned about this, and, and then it stopped, and that was the South Tower going down, I found out later. Uh, it was just a tremendous roar, and uh, it was above, and uh, uh, it sounded like it was coming towards, towards you, and... Uh, and then the wind, a very, very fierce wind, and my, my, my health started lifting me up off the ground. And so that's when I crouched down. All I, the next thing, I, I just crouched down. I got to the corner of the staircase by the railing, and I just got as small as I could possibly get. So obviously you were saved. How did that go down? I saw firefighters coming up. And I knew they were fresh troops. They had just arrived. They, they weren't covered in the, the dust, because we were totally encased in dust. Uh, it was, in fact, I had a bloody nose, and I was totally encased in this dust with a bloody nose. So I must have looked, I must have been some sight. But I saw the, the, the guys coming up, uh, and uh, as I got down, it turned out to be guys from my firehouse. Well, thank you so much for helping us out, and I hope you're recovering. Hey guys, I'm Kim jong -un. You're not Kim jong -un. I'm taking over News at Nine. <laughs> The United States is lying about me. Mm -mm. Everyone here enjoys their lives. Mm -mm. Food is plentiful. Mm -mm. For me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. So, what if my wife, brother, and uncle are no longer around? Mm -hmm. You can't prove anything. Mm -hmm. They could just be on vacation. Mm -hmm. You are not- You didn't see anything. Thank you. Goodbye.